Wow, what a beautiful opening. <laughs> you know, the mothers will always leave the way and many of us are here because of the craftswomanship of black women. And so I give honor and homage and glory to that. How many know what it means to open your mouth and to hear your ancestors come out? We give thanks to God and we give thanks to those who have paved the way before us. We give thanks to those, our descendants, our children, our, our nieces and nephews, our grandkids, our great grandkids who come after us. I wanna uh, just pray and then start right off because those of you who know me know I have things to say. <laughs> so just a moment of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And may the stories we share today honor our ancestors, our black church founders, our holy hell raisers, the works of their hands, the fire of their hearts and their creation and hope for our collective well-being. Ashe. Like black lives, black churches matter. And yes, I mean the buildings, the places made sacred by the labor and presence and witness of the people inside. But the feature of black church life I wanna talk about this morning is relationships, the ties that bind. The ties that bind. The binding of connections that may begin in church with that travel outdoors into everyday life. Some of us might've grown up with the term church family, right? which describes something that even more of us have experienced, that the black church is an intensely social affair. It's grounded in an experience of coming to know and being known by siblings in Christ more fully. Sure, we know that being Christian is about having and sustaining a personal walk with God. It's about what poet Langston Hughes described as the mystery, the darkness, the song and me. But we also know that being a Christian least black church wise, is about your relationship to your siblings, your sibs in Christ. That means church is a place where you expect to counter, encounter God and have a social experience. And I don't mean keeping up with the Joneses, y'all, or the shallow hey girls and other force field greetings. Some of us, or I mean I, might throw up from time to time to keep the peace and keep it moving down the street. I'm talking about church family. No, it's not the biological kind. It's often taken for granted. But if we pause to really think about it, our churches are and can be families. They have been. It's a type of kinship or what I call kincraft that Black people often make through inherited practices and traditions, shared sensibilities like a person shouldn't be without people by circumstance or necessity, through word and deed, and at times even with and through joy walk with me into a scene you might recognize, right? And hopefully this captures a bit of, of what union is like on the inside, especially for those of our members who haven't had the joy and privilege of worshiping with us yet. There are hugs and candy from church mothers that might make you feel a little shy, but also seen as kids. Trust me, kids, you may grow to miss both when you get older. Seen, where you're seen, greeted, and escorted to a seat by ushers in white gloves so well-dressed that their manner and bearing seem to tell you you're somebody too. Good morning. Between the amens, praise breaks, and hallelujahs, you inhabit a place, know a web of relationships where people ask about you and keep up with you. How are you? How you been? Are you wearing that? Did you get that promotion? Are you healing up well from surgery? Good job. Good job. What you doing for later, dinner later? Yeah, come on by. All A's, check you out, young scholar. You're shooting up like a tree, pretty as you wanna be. How's your mama and daddy doing? Oh no, they passed. How can we help? Sure, we can get a love offering together. Got yourself a new friend, girl? Tell us more. Happy birthday to you. Sing. For those of us more private, who hold our cards closer to our chests, who are navigating recovery from our trauma, who come from other traditions, we may receive or may not know what to do with Black church family love when we encounter it. But this love does important work. 
Black church families have served as therapeutic rehumanization centers where Black people are able to be seen in a world that has often closed its eyes to Black humanity, let alone Black beauty. Seen. And it's important to acknowledge Black churches still have more work to do because in the midst of these social webs are also interactions where some of us and our sibs have been treated anything like a sibling and called every other name but a child of God. And so we walk away or we search for a different or fuller way of being seen. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, you've given us a little imagery about what black church family is like on the inside, but where does this black church family come from? Acts 2, 44 through 47 helps us. This passage gives us a very descriptive picture of early Christian community life here. Church wasn't just an idea or a notion, it fostered community. And Acts gives us a vision of togetherness, shared belongings, frequent meetups, food sharing is one of my favorite parts, joyous hearts and praises to the Lord, group favor from God, the group had favor from God and growing numbers. Sounds a little bit like the positive scene of Black church family I presented, right? But if we're gonna to look to where else Black church families come from, we must take a journey to other sources as well. Our first stop is a far bleaker place. It's the slave ship. The transatlantic trade was responsible for the death, enslavement, torture, and tragic displacement of millions of Africans. For instance, just between the years of 1801 and 1866, approximately 3,873,600 Africans were captured and turned into cargo. They and their descendants would be forced into lifelong, uncompensated enslavement in the New World in one of the most brutal, exploitative regimes in human history, the psychological, financial, emotional, and political effects of enslavement are still suffered by their descendants today. But, but the history of Black people is not just a history of what was handed to them. It's also a history of what Africans and their descendants have made. They made each other into family in some of the bleakest circumstances we might imagine. Our enslaved African ancestors had been torn away from their families on the African mainland, but they made kinship in and beyond the slave ship as shipmates. If they managed to survive the dangerous and violent Middle Passage, which was not something that could be counted on, and if they managed to make it to the same locale in the Americas, shipmates counted each other as kin. They witnessed each other's weddings, they raised their children together. Sometimes they even prevented their children from marrying together, right? That's how you know you have a cousin, right? You can't marry. They shared moments of their life altering journey in all of its traumas. Perhaps one of the most breathtaking scenes of this shipmate kinship is taken from the birth of African-American culture. In the book, the authors outline a scene of shipmates leaving a slave ship in Suriname in 1790. And I'll read that scene for you now. The 40 or so people who make their way up from the cargo hold appear much the way you would have expected, had you expected. They are dark skinned and slender, and some give the appearance of being quite ill. They are solemn, apparently resigned to their new fates in the new world. Some have difficulty standing, and most are blinking in the sunlight. These new African Americans surprise you in only one respect. They have stars in their hair. Not real stars, of course. The new arrivals have had their heads shaved, leaving patches of hair shaped like stars and half moons. The capitalist asks the captain why he cut their hair like that, and the captain disclaims all responsibility. They did it themselves, he says, the one to the other, by the help of a broken bottle and without soap. Stars and half moons in their hair seeing and carrying the new tribal marks of the thing that they would be called Black, the basis of their new kinship. You mean for me, there's a miracle in this. I confess at times, the intellectual explanations I use or am used to using, they fall short. Instead, I'm left with a sense of wonder of how Black people can make 
a way out of no way of how we, to use the words of Alexis Pauline Gums, we could become whoever we needed to be for each other. With God as their witness, kinship was a form of shared shape shifting to meet new conditions and emerging needs. And my friends, kinship is a human need. This kinship created out of suffering and the collective will to survive recalls Proverbs 17, 17, read by Toss. It reads that a sibling is born for a time of adversity. Enslaved African shipmates show us the ship and kinship, the relationships that come out of trying to find a way to make a life through a living hell on earth together. Black church families are held together by such traditions. That is the part of the story of how strangers separated from homelands turned themselves into a we. That is some of the stuff we're made of. Because some of us know a sibling when we see one, don't we? We know who our family is by how they show up for us, amen? Let's journey to another place. This time we're in a grove or maybe even a forest. We're walking towards a clearing surrounded by a densely wooded interior. We've stolen away from our plantations where we're not supposed to be here. We know the dangers, but we need this gathering. We need it. We need to be seen. One of our kindred has brought a pot to the gathering. When our queue is prompted by a community elder, the pot is turned over so that its open side faces the ground. This was a West African tradition that was believed to silence the voices of those gathered and to protect them from discovery by slave patrollers, local whites, and black informants within their own communities. As these were seeker gatherings, not a lot has been written about what happened in these hush arbor meetings. But according to Boris Nunley, people gathered to exercise a freedom in a space they made for themselves. Such, su some hush arbors were used by the enslaved to teach and learn how to read. We might also imagine them as spaces where people performed curative rituals, as spaces for emotional expression, sorrow, joy, rage, trauma, as opportunities for Black people to use their bodies for their needs instead of the enrichment of plantation owners. We also know that Hush Arbor gatherings were spaces where people gathered to worship God, to praise God with body, song, shout, and words their own way. Now, I also believe that these Hush Arbor gatherings were spaces where people questioned God where they had the space to air the most difficult questions of their experience. I believe the Hush Arbor was also a space for why God, right? Because how could people going through an experience like slavery not have questions for their God, but their community would have answers. Alba Rabato describes spaces like Hush Arbor gatherings as an invisible institution, as the precursor to the independent black church. Union, our churches have a long history of being about gathering instead of buildings. Look at us now, of being about healing rather than just demonstrating our individual piety. Our self-determination and our relations were the centerpiece of our ancestors' spiritual lives, the spiritual spirituality they made and chose for themselves. Their kinship was powerful and sacred, dangerous even. And I know some of you might wonder if Hush Arbor gatherings were places where enslaved Black Christians could be themselves and practice their religion, why would these gatherings be illegal? The threat of the Hush Arbor was its challenge to planter Christianity, right? this planter Christianity they would have been exposed to on the plantation. So the Hush Arbor wouldn't have been the only Christianity our enslaved ancestors would have had access to. They would have had access to planter Christianity. This planter Christianity would have enjoined them as servants to love their masters. It would have been dispensed by white male plantation owners themselves who served as clergy to the residents of their plantations or an overwhelming white male clerical class who supported the plantation complex, right? We know that there were clergy who were slave owners, right? We know that Harvard was founded by the sale of enslaved people, the money and, and, and 
uh, uh, profit made from that. We also know that there was a white male clerical class who stifled their critiques of the plantation complex to find a middle ground solution. Planet Christianity was not a Christianity intended for the human flourishing of Black people. And it's important to note, it was a Christianity that our folks in large number rejected. And we know the offspring of Planet Christianity exists today, doesn't it? We've seen it, Union. It's the kind of Christianity that tells us to wait and trust that change is coming and that the change is one that will be given to us, not one that we take or make for ourselves. It's a change whose terms and scope and conditions will be determined mostly by people external to our communities who don't share our plight, our material conditions, interests, history, or concerns. People interested in compromise and partial freedoms and are quick to remind us that all lives matter. People who remind us of a long suffering Christ, not a fleshy Jesus who flipped tables on money changers, or we might say rejected predatory racialized high interest loans, or a non-complacent Jesus who rebuked religious leaders more concerned with religious comportment than communal care. Like some of our kindred who are more committed to respectability than sharing life with people. A Jesus so committed, instead, we serve a Jesus so committed to the full humanity and spiritual expression of his kindred that this Jesus was lynched by the Roman state with the complicity of Jewish elites. In a conversation for the, the show Souls, James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni, G, Nikki Giovanni talk about Black Christianity. Baldwin says, baby, what we did with Jesus was not supposed to happen. Nikki Giovanni responds respectfully, I believe that. Baldwin again, we took him, we took that cat over and made him ours. He has nothing whatever to do with the white Jesus in Montgomery, Alabama and that white church, we did something else with him. Union, our folk made Jesus their Lord and their brother. Our people made Jesus their Lord and their kindred, born of suffering. Our, our people made Jesus their sibling. Our ancestors, y'all, our ancestors were so audacious. They made their kinship sacred and they made their Jesus black and they wilded Christianity because to them and, and to them and their Jesus, the Jesus they made, that Pharisee shit wouldn't do. And they knew, they knew. And some of us need to recognize that these relations, the kind of ties they created with each other in the midst of, the kind of ties we create with each other, our commitment to life-giving relationships, kinship born in adversity, kinship that can keep secrets, kinship made in acknowledgement of our full humanity. Oh, Union, these are central to our Christian walk. Some of us are more comfortable with God than our fellow Christians because our God, who's always been our witness, our ancestors who are presently our witness, they don't care about the church endowment. Now that doesn't mean not give because the offering's coming up. <laughs> we got to pay for the building. We got to we got to keep a history for the children, right? But it means to be aware of what motivates that giving. What comes alongside that giving, that check writing is not enough. God and our ancestors, they're going to want to know, did you give of yourself? Have you been a child of God and a sibling in Christ? Do you show up just on Sundays or do you show up when you're needed? Do you break bread? and share life and its joys and its pains with your siblings. What kinship have you made? Is it the kind that's only in your house? It's confined to the boundary of your front door? Have you been someone's safe harbor? Have you held their secrets in deep confidence like the hush arbor? What relations can you put on this altar? Or what kinship journeys might you need to start today? Amen.